Okay. Okay. Okay, so <coughs> I want to thank the organizers for the great work and also for let, um, giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, so <coughs> I will talk about uh, <coughs> black holes and large order quantum geometry and uh, most of the time <coughs> I will probably talk about uh, how you get uh, this large order predictions in topological string theory. Now, the, <coughs> the uh, reasons for looking at topological string theory are shortly listed in this, uh, uh, in this table. So first of all, we need it anyway, because uh, string theory can be viewed as, topolo uh, as coupling topological gravity to matter. And then this topological string theory describes the coupling of a certain, uh, to a certain uh, matter subsector, which is eventually integrable. And uh, it's a great laboratory for, uh, <coughs> for testing large N ideas. And uh, also, as we have heard just um, uh, in the talk before, it also is um, important in uh, making checks on the, uh, on the black hole um, entropy predictions in uh, reasonable dimensions. <coughs> so uh, <coughs> the central object in this <coughs> topological string theory is actually the um, free energy or the so-called partition function, all this is, uh, <coughs> has to be taken in quotes because uh, this can be uh, often a formal power series and uh, <coughs> it also can be uh, applied to open uh, string theory but uh, in this talk we will mainly uh, focus on the closed case, so over here. And maybe the most interesting question is whether uh, these things are integrable and whether this uh, integral structure would eventually teach us something about the non-perturbative completion of uh, string theory as a whole. So uh, in the simplest case uh, that this works, you see the manifestation of the integral structure is that this FT fulfills uh, a lot of differential equations and you can write this in terms of nonlinear differential equations or you can write it in terms of linear differential equations which just annihilate this uh, partition function. But then you need, in addition, boundary conditions to, uh, to somehow solve this, uh, this system of equations. And uh, in some sense, uh, in my talk, I want to, uh, so to say, argue that this in the Calabi-Yau case is not much different and, in fact, uh, almost as good as in this, uh, in this toy uh, case. So uh, <coughs> there is a long story of coupling this uh, stuff to gravity and maybe the most interesting uh, uh, gravity that you can think of is this twisted matter in the A model because in this case uh, the topological string partition function or the, uh, or the actually the free energy calculates uh, the Gromov of Witten invariance and this Gromov of Witten invariant is in Q but uh, this is uh, as we have also heard closely related to integer invariance which uh, count uh, which serve as, uh, as uh, built indices which serve as counting functions for eventually for the microscopic entropies of the black hole. Now uh, <coughs> is of course uh, and the most interesting question, about, uh, the most interesting fact about this formula, a question that we have is what is the dimension of this moduli space that we integrate over? And uh, this um, is given by uh, Groton, Dick, Hirzebuch, Riemann, Roch. And you see quickly, if you glance at this formula, that uh, the Calabriau threefold case is very special in this formula because then this term vanishes and because the dimension of the manifold is three, this term vanishes. And therefore, uh, the virtual dimension is zero for all uh, for all genus, for all genera. <coughs> now, um, <coughs> in some sense, then this problem reduces to a point counting problem, at least in a, in a generic case, but uh, um <coughs> this generic case is not always um, uh, realized. So, um <coughs> so if it's a point counting problem, you will obviously solve it by localization. You need some action because these points have no hair, so you have to somehow uh, give them the structure, and that is done by embedding the problem into some group action and then uh, solving it. So, for instance, <coughs> for the Calabi-Yau fourfolds, uh, just as an implication of this formula, you see 
uh, that this uh, dimension becomes negative if the uh, genus becomes larger than two, and then there are the, just no invariants. And in fact, these uh, things which are at genus uh, one and genus zero, we all count, uh, calculated in a collaboration with Rahul. But today I will uh, basically focus on the critical case, which is uh, three dimensions. So here you see a little overview uh, about the question, which is of course crucial, uh, how to compute these things. And, uh, and you see there is a big difference between the uh, uh, non-compact case, in particular if it's toric, then basically all the ideas that we have uh, in order to count these things were quite nice. So there is this localization, which was put forward by mathematicians, which are, appear here in blue. And then there is a large n-duality, uh, maybe best uh, formulated in terms of this vertex. Then there's relative chromo invariant by which you can actually prove the vertex. And uh, in the B model, you have also matrix model description, and you can also make directly sense of the Donaldson Thomas invariant. But on the compact case, on the other hand, uh, the situation is not as good. And uh, so, so it's good in the sense that Konsevich got his Fields Medal for proving this one, but for higher genus, uh, it's not clear how to do the localization, because you basically do the localization in the ambient space, and, uh, and it's not easy or uh, actually uh, it looks very bad if you try to restrict the localization formula which works in genus zero uh, to the Calabiao. Now with the large N duality we don't know exactly how to do this and with uh, relative chroma of written invariants, uh, Gatvan and then later on uh, Pandrea Pande and uh, Okunkov and Maulik, I guess I forgot here, uh, have, um, uh, uh, can do this in principle, but the combinatorics is almost uh, so that you can uh, not come up with a single number. Uh, then <coughs> uh, in the B model, well, uh, uh, Richard Thomas and, and Rahul have announced the paper which, uh, which I believe there is much progress here. Then in the A model, of, uh, in the B model, there's of course this uh, seminal paper by Candela, Stella, Osa, Green and Parks. And, uh, and now where I will talk most about is, so to say, to uh, use the holomorphic an uh, anomaly uh, for the local case and then, um, and then um, so to say, extend this to the global case because this is the only way that we can, so to say, uh, lift this uh, question mark, which is a crucial question mark if we think about black holes. Then there is also a, <coughs> a very nice way which, uh, which has the flavor that it brings on modular forms that is comparing with the heterotic string and there is a lot of beautiful work on this. And by the way, also uh, quite recently, Maulik and Pandria Panda have proven some of these conjectures uh, mathematically. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> so now uh, the improvement in the critical case for, uh, for the compact case is of course very, very complicated. And uh, it's, it's built on this uh, publications uh, here. So uh, <coughs> basically the idea is we have to implement, instead of so to say making the theory massless, we, we use the space-time uh, symmetries. And uh, in particular we use a modular uh, property. So now if you do this properly, then you find, or what we find basically is that this KDV hierarchy, okay, okay this is uh, essentially replaced by the holomorphic anomaly equations, which is clear, so this is a rough overview of what happens. So what happens here is if you take an uh, anti-holomorphic derivative of this Fg, you get something which uh, can be thrown on the boundary, and if you throw this integral on the boundary, you get uh, these sorts of terms. And you can also formulate it in a, in a way which is linear. So this uh, is essentially the wave function properties of Z. Then you get equations which look like that. But the <coughs> most important thing is that all these equations uh, need boundary conditions. For instance, here you can simply add a holomorphic function, which is called a holomorphic anomaly. And uh, this um, boundary condition, in a sense, becomes the most, uh, uh, most severe problem in this thing. So, uh, so the integrality comes from this worksheet analysis, but then it leaves the holomorphic ambiguity, which is a function, and then with the space-time modularity, we can actually reduce this function to discrete data, and eventually by the gap conditions, we can anchor the full thing. So in order to do this, we uh, need an understanding of the modular group, which I call gamma m, and we need also some, uh, some, um, some control over the, tr over the transformation uh, functions uh, transformation property of our function under this modular group. So since this is all easy in the local case, I will uh, 
uh, discussed with a famous example that is basically cyber written theory. Everybody knows it. It's related to topological string because, uh, by this geometric engineering approach. And <coughs> so what happens is that the mirror of this geometry on which you have to take a double scaling limit to get actually the cyber written uh, theory is given uh, by a curve which has gamma 2 monodromy. So gamma m is gamma 2 in this case and is generated by the monodromy around the monopole point, the asymptotic freedom, and the Dian point. And this, uh, what I call omega star, is, so to say, the pullback of the, of the uh, holomorphic 3-0 form from the Calabi-Yau to the local Calabi-Yau, <coughs> from the global Calabi-Yau to the local. Now, <coughs> so how does this modularity and the worksheet tr uh, transformation property work together? Um, so first of all, <coughs> It's a true statement that all these FGs must be invariant under the uh, monodromy group of the problem, which in our case is gamma 2. So for instance, F1 uh, would be actually even uh, invariant under SL2Z because this, uh, this, uh, this form degree transformation of the EDAS here is compensated by this M of tau. Now, <coughs> the generations are captured by Feynman rules. Uh, this was uh, found by BCOV. And, uh, and this Feynman rules here, this, uh, this red lines, actually, if you look at it, they transform as modular weights of form of, uh, modular forms of weight 2. Uh, and uh, that they are of weight 2 is also easy to see. This basically becomes, uh, becomes because here you have a derivative on this object, which is invariant. And if you look more closely, uh, then it is, of course, also uh, non-holomorphic, because uh, this guy was non-holomorphic. So it gives the famous uh, 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 holomorphic extension of the second Eisenstein series E2. And, uh, <coughs> and in fact, this is the only holomor uh, anti-holomorphic dependence of the, full, uh, of the full FG. Because now you can, so to say, by uh, combinatorics of this Feynman rule, you can immediately write down uh, the, um, <coughs> the expression for the FG where, of course, since this guy is invariant, the sigma has to have uh, modular weight minus 3, and then the fg are all uh, modular forms of the appropriate rate, of the appropriate rate which is uh, 2G, uh, 6g minus 1, and uh, the invariance of the fg just means mathematically that all the thing is, uh, is generate, is, uh, is in the ring of, mo of quasi, uh, quasi home of almost holomorphic modular forms of gamma 2, and they are finitely generated by this E2 by a combination of uh, Jacobi theta function, uh, this one and this one. So already the problem is, so to say, uh, reduced to a finite problem. Now, you can do it actually much better because uh, if the anti-holomorphic dependence is just in this E2, then of course you can uh, determine everything in the in the expression for FG, which is proportional to E2, which is proportional to E2, because you can replace the anti-holomorphic derivative uh, with the derivative with respect to E2, and then you have also to use that the uh, ring of of almost holomorphic function is close under the mass derivative. And, uh, and you can, uh, and this is, uh, since this is a true statement, you basically at the end have only to integrate polynomials and you get all the coefficients of the, uh, of the uh, powers of, uh, of this E2 which carries the anti-holomorphic dependence. So uh, the only thing which uh, I cannot determine, if you look here, is if the E2 power is zero, and uh, this is, so to say, the only holomorphic or modular uh, ambiguity, but it's a form of degree 6d minus c, so this has, in general, has 3g over 2 um, uh, unknowns, and this I have to provide you next as boundary conditions. Now let me say a, a few things about the global properties. So of course you know that in cyber written there is an asymptotic free phase and there is a magnetic phase, and the global properties are as simple as uh, they could be. So if you want to have the dual expansion, you just make S-duality on this guy, and you get a dual expansion. Note, however, that this S-duality is not a symmetry, it's not a monodromy symmetry, so you get really a different uh, expansion. So you get immediately uh, the holomorphic expansion by taking a limit uh, at asymptotic freedom where you take T bar to infinity at that strong coupling where you take T D to infinity and that would be the guy which go into Wilsonian effective action. So this can also be seen as a metaplectic transformation on the wave function um, <coughs> but of course in this uh, case of the modular transformation it is um, m probably more convenient to see it in this way. 
Now, <coughs> now comes the most important uh, thing here, namely at strong coupling we find the gap index expansion. So, in other words, uh, you see that this FG, they start out with, um, <coughs> with a uh, high negative power of the dual uh, Wilsonian action variable, and then the next power is uh, positive, and there are 2G minus 2 independent vanishing condition, and now since 2G minus 2 is greater than uh, the greatest number, which is above, uh, natural number, which is above 3G over 2, um, we, uh, the theory is completely solved. So, <coughs> this, there are other methods uh, by which you can solve them, as you have seen in this intermediate slide. In particular, there are also direct worksheet instant term localization by Nekrasov, Nakajima, uh, and all these people. But of course, they will also only provide you, so to say, perturbative expansion in T near infinity, and they don't uh, give much information about the global properties of these functions. No, now, uh, why is there a gap? Well, I mean, I can offer two sort of physical explanations. So first of all, there is this digraph buffer description that Cyberg witness actually describes by a matrix model. And then in this matrix model, you typically have from a measure a high negative power, which goes in this way with the genus, but then the perturbative expansion is actually, um, is actually regular. Another, um, maybe more interesting expansion for what follows is a low energy effective action explanation. So you see that this FG is actually uh, contains the gravity photon couplings, and they are given by a Schwinger loop calculation, as was done by many people. Um, <coughs> and uh, for if you, if, if Andy is right that there's just one hypermultiplet coming down at the conifold, and TD is the mass of this hypermultiplet, then this uh, formula, this Schwinger loop calculation, gives I immediately this uh, this, uh, this behavior that I I have. And if there are no further masses particle, and you uh, cross your fingers a little bit, then there will be no other contributions at, uh, uh, at least nothing that, co uh, that will create holes. So now I go to the uh, compact case, and this um, <coughs> was done with, uh, with uh, our postdoc Min Shig and with uh, our student, uh, with a student at Wisconsin Quakenbush. So here you see the quintic, and I have drawn you uh, again the universal mirror quintic, like I have drawn you the universal elliptic curve. And uh, you see the picture doesn't look that uh, different because I restrict myself to cases which have actually three singular, uh, uh, which have three regular singular points, and these have all names. So one is the conifold point, the other is the Gettner point or orbifold point, and this one is the one, a large complex structure point which uh, corresponds to large volume of the mirror manifold. So of course we know the monodromy around these, and it generates some discrete subgroup of SP4Z. But uh, we don't know much about this, uh, about this group, but uh, from the, of course, from the mirror symmetry approach, we can, so to say, if we want to have, uh, if we want to have modular functions, we can uh, construct them by mirror symmetry, and that uh, works over the periods of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, quintic, which fulfill the picard fuchs equation. And uh, so even so, even the index is unknown. It's even uh, not known whether they are finite in SP4Z uh, or not, uh, but we can build these modular objects using the periods. And one of the most prominent modular objects will be actually uh, the complex parameter itself, which I call J, and you see this is the expansion of that. It's an expansion which uh, resembles the J function of the elliptic curve in that all the uh, powers, all the coefficients are integral and um, positive, but uh, there's no explanation why this is uh, the case. Now, so this function already gives us, so to say, the most, uh, the most useful uh, modular object to play with, and in fact, if you use regularity at the Gettner point, and uh, if you use this gap behavior of the FG at the conifold, which uh, happens to have, be at j equal 1, and then you use a regularity at the large complex structure point, you see that the uh, CG0, the guy that you cannot de uh, determine, is actually uh, just uh, given a polynomial in uh, 1 over uh, 1 minus uh, j. So <coughs> let me uh, make it just a, a quick remark to, uh, to, um, to connect this thing with the stuff of the, on the Riemann surface. So on the Calabiao, uh, you don't have um, um, normal Jacobians, but you have this intermediate Jacobians. And this problem arises like follows. So we have this invariant complex parameters, which I call J. 
and they run from 1 to H to 1 and we have local projective coordinates which we usually uh, use in the Wilsonian action which are quotients of that but there are two maps from this modelized space uh, to this intermediate Jacobians and they are well known I mean in supergravity you know that this guy has positive imaginary part and therefore it's used as the met uh, kinetic uh, term of the moduli and then this term so to say has, uh, has, um, has signature but <coughs> the point about these two uh, tensors is that they actually transform nice under SPH3Z uh, uh, they uh, pr uh, transform nice and projectively under this uh, under this uh, transformation under this transformation so <coughs> uh, using this fact I can basically parallel the discussion about the Riemann surface uh, to the Calabial case so we have this F1 which is a total invariant and this uh, was done in collaboration with uh, with Aganacci Bouchard and also with Grimm and uh, and Marcus Mourinho and Marlene Weiss so if you look at this um, at this um, F1 then, <coughs> then uh, the, um, it's given very similar, so basically what was EDA plays the role of this, uh, is now played by uh, phi, and uh, what uh, was E2 generalizes now to a tensor which you, uh, uh, which you differentiate this uh, phi by, uh, by this matrix tau that I introduced on the last slide. And also uh, you, it's a unique way to, to make it model line variant by adding this part. So this guy as the E2 uh, transforms with a shift, but this guy has no shift. So this transforms as a tensor form under SP4Z. And then the FG is uh, precisely in this form. And, um, <coughs> and so uh, basically the thing that, uh, parallel very much the discussion above. Also it's true that this propagators uh, are easily related to the propagators of BCOV, so it's actually the easiest relation that you can think of. It's just the uh, transformation matrix which brings you to the big, from the small phase space to the big phase space. Now, <coughs> the point is, of course, that the generators of this ring of almost holomorphic uh, tensors of gamma M with a subgroup of SPH3Z are not known, but uh, there is an important paper of Yao and um, Yamaguchi which, uh, which show that at least the one that you need to uh, write down the FGs are known. <coughs> so, um, so they claim that uh, you have, um, <coughs> or, uh, I mean they observe that you have a finite number of generators. Uh, these, are the, uh, the, these are the anti-holomorphic generators here and this is the holomorphic generator and at the end you can write PG which are in a very simple way related to the FG as a degree 2G minus 3 weighted in homogeneous polynomial in terms of uh, three non-holomorphic generators and one holomorphic generator which is related to this J which I introduced earlier on. So uh, <coughs> the holomorphic anomaly equation can also be integrated directly if you assume that all these functions are to say indep uh, are independent uh, over the ring of functions and uh, now you have to impose the boundary conditions so the boundary conditions at the conifold in the right variables actually uh, exhibit this gap as before so this gives 2g minus 2 conditions then regularity at the Gettner point uh, provides uh, 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 this number of conditions and if you uh, uh, so are left with 2g minus uh, 1 over 5 unknowns but you have also cast to noble bound from uh, gen uh, from uh, of written invariants at large radius. So basically, we understand the double covering of these guys, and we know uh, that the first of this copa uh, coma wafer invariants appears if there is a really a curve of genus G, and uh, we we can uh, separate so the, the double covering contribution from the real contribution, and then from the adjunction formula in P2, you find there are basically no curves. I mean, it's a rough formula uh, when the degree is uh, lower than the square root of G so this is roughly this formula and of course uh, this uh, number of unknowns grows linearly with G while this is a square root so uh, at some points they will meet and they meet at genus 51 so at, uh, <coughs> up to genus 51 you can actually calculate this, uh, this invariance the uh, constraint is actually not very relevant because the computer so to say uh, is, uh, gets tired uh, about genus 30 <coughs> But uh, you, ca you can see that this will be then uh, what we uh, conjecture to be 
uh, the, uh, the BPS counting of, of black holes. So these are the Gopakumarafa invariants. And you see uh, what is very important is there are these negative numbers. In fact, it becomes almost alternating if you go out. And since this is the highest spin, you also get the largest contribution from this number. So now I come so to say a little bit about this black hole uh, conjecture. So there is by Beckenried and Meyer is a formula for this spinning black holes in five dimension where Q is the Krabi photon charge which is fixed by the attractor mechanism and uh, there are also calculations of the R2 term which gives you such a contribution and with, um, <coughs> with, uh, with Sheldon and Kuno um, we have conjectured something about the microscopic uh, uh, entropy counting in this case which is of course related to this uh, Gopakumarafa invariance uh, in this way so this would be, uh, would be the, uh, the degeneracies and uh, so we can, for instance, uh, form this ratio and test this ratio. This is for actually for spin equals zero, and then the test looks like this. So basically, you have to make a couple of uh, Richardson's transforms to speed up the convergence, but then you see that the convergence is within uh, less than 2% in this case. So what is important, we have a sample of this Calabria house, about uh, 14 models or something, so you can actually vary this kappa, which is the triple intersection number, it always agrees that good. And uh, for degree M, uh, for a higher spin, uh, the uh, agreement becomes, uh, <coughs> becomes uh, not as good, so it's in the 10% range. Uh, but we can also find indication that the R squared contribution actually are important and, uh, and improve the, uh, the uh, correspondence. And as um, Moore already mentioned, uh, this uh, Denev Moore scaling, which I unfortunately wrote with 2n, uh, uh, is more like 2 uh, above 2 than, uh, than, uh, than close, to, uh, close to 3. So uh, this gives some indication that actually the OSV conjecture is, uh, is probably um, <coughs> valid in a long, in a wider range than it was sought by. Uh, well, but this is uh, this you have heard in the paper, so I I, I stop here. <laughs> Any questions? Come on, Andy, in the back. Please wait for Mike. Sorry. Sorry. This is in five dimensions, right? right. And then it more was in four dimensions. Right, so of course we, we uh, I stick here to five dimensions because I don't want to get into this uh, map between five and four dimensions, uh, which you know very well, so maybe I can ask you about this map. But, uh, but, um, <coughs> but uh, you can, of course, what, what Dennis and Moore say is basically a, a, a very, uh, as you have seen, a very, um, a re uh, I mean, definite mathematical prediction about the growing of the Donaldson Thomas invariant. And this I can uh, check because uh, from this uh, formula here, uh, from this uh, sort of say, uh, thing, I can uh, definitely calculate the Donaldson Thomas invariance up to degrees 18. So if I know everything which is lower. So I just uh, make a numerical analysis of this data. And as I said, basically the fact that you have this negative signs improve the thing and, and make it more going towards 2 than to 3. For questions, comments? No? Well, then I propose before we break for lunch, we thank uh, Albrecht and this morning's speakers once again. <laughs> and we we'll see you back here in the afternoon.